one of the things that I think slows us down and I see slowing us down is conversations where we say or a lot. So I like solar or wind. I like solar or natural gas with CCS. I like electric vehicles or I like zero carbon cement, you know, whatever the examples are. I like one thing. We, we step back and we switch that to an and conversation. This and this and this. I'm for all these things that get us to that goal. One of the things I think I learned incredibly well at NetPower is, listen, we had some fantastic scientists, PhDs out the wazoo, probably too many of them. Right. What we what we learned early on was that they weren't the people to build and to maintain and to operate. Right. We needed to build all that tent big enough for all those people to be under and leverage their expertise because our smartest people had no idea when it came to how to maintain pumps and valves and compressors and all of these other things that, in, that go into maintaining a coal plant or maintaining a steel plant. It, it gives us, I think, an opportunity to be generous with each other again to say, we know we need to spend money. We know we need to try lots of stuff. We know one of us alone is not gonna do the job. So let's all work together and do this incredibly important thing. Welcome back. And on today's Yang Speaks, folks, Texas froze over the entire state covered with snow. And we need to talk about this. So we're going to continue our limited series on the future of, and this is the future of energy. Because when your most southern state or one of your most southern states known for its desert is covered in snow, you need to figure out why and what's going to happen. So here's what we did. I did something a little crazy. We're gonna have three guests on this episode at the same time. And I think it worked out pretty pretty great, actually. Um, I think we avoided the chaos that it could have been. The three guests I wanted to have on covered three areas. I wanted to cover the science, the policy and health of this, like the healthcare piece of climate change and energy, and then the business investment side. So we have three guests that cover each of these. So the first one's Dr. Julio Friedman, who's a senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. He's an expert in carbon capture. He used to also work in governance. So he was a principal deputy, I love these government titles, principal deputy assistant secretary of the Office of Fossil Energy at the Department of Energy. But he does have a lot of DOE Department of Energy experience. So I'm glad Dr. Julio Freeman's on. Second guest is Dr. Melissa Lott. Dr. Lott is an expert on the healthcare side and healthcare effects of climate change. So she's a senior research scholar at Columbia University as well and works with Dr. Friedman and, and he was saying they're a perfect complement in terms of looking at both sides and I agreed. And the last person we had on is doc, is not doctor, David Freed. He's not a doctor, uh, he's less cool. Just kidding, David's amazing. He's an entrepreneur. He was a Forbes 30 under 30 entrepreneur in energy. And he's, I think 32, 33 now and has already built a power plant um, that burns energy at a vastly efficient rate um, and has now worked in the investment side, private equity side, of clean energy and can talk about how we need to get the private sector involved in solving these problems. So you've got David Freed, Dr. Melissa Lott, and Dr. Julio Freeman on this podcast. It's fascinating. We talk about what happened in Texas. We talk about what's going to happen. You're not going to want to miss it. Tune in. Yang Speaks, the future of energy. All right, folks, welcome back to your newest episode of The Future Of. And we are talking about the future of energy. And there's an argument to be made. This is probably one of probably the most important future topic we'll bring on, because if we get this wrong, we're probably all toast. Or our, if you're talking about the impact of the future on our humanity, this one probably hits the hardest. So joining us today, we've got Dr. Julio Friedman, Dr. Melissa Lott in Forbes 30 Under 30, let's call it an energy tech entrepreneur, David Freed. Um, I'm excited for all three of you to be here. So welcome to Yang Speaks in the Future of Energy. Welcome, all. It's a treat to be here. Thanks for having us. 
Yeah, thanks a lot, Zach. So full disclosure here, while Dr. Lott is joining us, she's joining us from her car because <laughs> there's a snowstorm in Austin, Texas, where you are. Is that, mm-hmm. and am I describing the situation correctly? Yeah, I think uh, last night we got a, uh, an inch or so of ice. It was just spitting ice, raining ice, not sleet, raining ice pellets. Um, and then it got covered by about eight inches of snow. And we were supposed to have a 40 minute blackout. And that was 13 hours ago and counting. So I'm in the car. <laughs> That's where I'm at. I appreciate the uh, resilience here and the dedication to, to joining. Um, and frankly, there's nothing more fitting than being in Texas in a snowstorm um, without power because of this. And we, it's, it's all the more reason we need to be having these conversations. Thank you all for joining. I want to dive in the meat of this. So the three of you, I think, are, are three exceptional people to unpack this question I have, which I want to talk about the energy problem and let's call it that leads into the climate crisis we are having today. Like, let's level set where we're at as society right now. How bad is it? What's going on? Dr. Friedman, let's let's start with you, if you wouldn't mind. Um, give us a little, like, a high-level overview of, like, our energy situation as a country, as a world, uh, um, as we speak. Sure. So where we are right now is recognizing how badly we've failed, and based on that, uh, marshalling for the work ahead. And the good news is, you know, Uh, the first step is acknowledgement. You know, we have finally acknowledged that we are not going to do what we thought we could do in the time frame we could do it, so we simply need to do more. Um, There's lots of reasons to explain how we ended up here, but fundamentally, we now know that we have to go very far and very fast. And we have to get to net zero. In a word, the future of energy is net zero. If it's not net zero, we failed because we don't stabilize climate ever. As long as we keep emitting, as long as we keep adding to CO2 in the atmosphere, temperatures keep going up. So we have to get to net zero to stabilize at any target. And if we want to have that stabilization happen, like with an ecosystem to go with it, then we need to get there within a very short amount of time. We need to get net to net zero somewhere between 30 to 50 years, depending on what fraction of the global coral population you want to die. So that's the setup. And th- th- like that part's not actually debated a whole lot. You're telling serious academia, it's all general consensus here? Not only general academia, most of the governments in the world, most of the CEO and Fortune 500 companies of the world all agree to this. What you do is where everybody starts disagreeing. And, and there is no one answer to that. But there's a lot of things we all generally know and that we accept And a lot of the discussion actually doesn't start from the parts we agree on. They start from the ends of the dumbbell where people screech at each other. But in fact, academia, governments, serious companies generally agree on the foundational elements as well. So the agreement, and maybe this is for you, Dr. Locke, I know you've done a lot of work in the the human impact of this and particularly in the healthcare side. The agreement is that we're melting the planet. Is that what we've like accepted? And then if we don't do anything, we're essentially done by 2050, 20, 100 years. What's our, <laughs> what are your thoughts on this? And what's our time frame there? Yeah, I mean, the evidence is like, if you look at the data, you can try to look at it in the most optimistic way possible, but it is so clear that climate change is already happening. It's already impacting our health and it's just going to get worse until we do something significant. And, you know, we've done little things in different parts of the world. Um, There's a little more ambition in some countries, less than others. But we are certainly not on track to what we call minimize the health impacts of climate change. We're certainly not on track to keep us to this target that a lot of people like to talk about, which is two degrees Celsius. And forget the degrees for a minute. The exact degrees don't matter so much. The higher the change in temperature, the higher the degrees, the worse it is, the more people die, the more people are sick. Like the more natural disasters we have, the higher the number, the worse it gets. And so our goal is to keep it as low as possible to protect ourselves and to protect our health. And so there's just a lot of consensus around this. When you look at the data, even if you want to be optimistic and kind of, you know, okay, conservative number, just look at the bottom, it's still really bad. It's still really bad. There's a lot of positive efforts in this space. Like people are doing great work. Are we close to solving this or we need to like pump the you know, step on the gas pedal to accelerate change? We need to massively accelerate what we're doing. Really? That's also really clear. Yeah. So 
I'm not trying to diminish the great stuff we've done. We've got a lot of corporations and government stepping up and saying, we're going to change and we're going to shift. And same with people. You've got communities like the city of Des Moines, Iowa, just passed a 24-7 clean electricity standard for the city. They're like, you know what? We're going to change this. And this was just weeks ago. There's lots of good stuff going on. But on right now, I think the latest numbers, what, Julio, were at 3.7 degrees, something like that. 3.7 is, is awful. We want well below two. We want, you know, going towards 1.5. So we're not in a good place. And until we make some real shifts, we're not going to be on the path we want to be on. A good way to think about it is if everybody did what they promised under the Paris Agreement, we'd still be screwed. We would basically be at a three degree, 3.2 degree world if we did everything that we committed to in Paris. Most people, when they think about energy, they actually think about cars and electricity. Because that's what people see when they think about energy. They think about cars. They see cars. They see electricity. They're like, oh, that's energy. That is not energy. That's 40% of energy. There's another 60% out there, which is trucks, ships, planes, steel making, chemicals, cement, and at things like agriculture. Just like putting fertilizer around the ground adds to greenhouse gas load. Things like deforestation as to greenhouse gas loading. So if we electrified everything with zero carbon electricity and electrified all the cars, massively difficult, super awesome. I sincerely hope we get there as quickly as possible. 40% of the problem. When you say that three degrees Celsius number that we're tracking towards, when is that, right? Is that 20 years? Is that 100? Like, and frankly, I think that's one of the challenges we have is that the average human's like, oh, that's 100 years from now. That's 200 years from now. We'll be fine. We'll be smart enough then. What's the timing? I mean, we're talking, when we talk about average temperature rise, we're talking about the end of the century. But when we talk about the health impacts, we actually are quantifying what's happening right now. So something is interesting. We just did a bunch of analysis around it. But bottom line is, if we meet Paris Agreement targets, or if we meet this net zero Coolio's talking about, so if we actually put the pedal down on the, you know, the gas, as it were, though it'd be something other than gas. Um, you know, we're talking about something like 8 million at least lives a year that, that will be saved versus lost in 2040, just off of a couple of the different health effects, just off of the small ones. Um, so that's, I mean, it's millions of lives every single year that we will be losing starting at the middle of the century. So hopefully, if I'm lucky, you know, in a time when I will still be here um, and our kids will certainly still be here. All right, new sponsor alert. I want to tell you guys about Parachute because Parachute, essentially their goal is to make people feel at home and their, their let's call it tagline is making home your happy place. And I just got my sheets and towels and a bathrobe from Parachute and I promise you they are making my home a happy place. They are so comfortable. It's like lying on a cloud. I don't know how to explain it. It's like soft and beautiful and warm and fuzzy. And I promise you, it's freaking amazing. And I literally, this is so stupid, but I look forward to taking a shower because I get to wrap myself in these freaking towels. It's like butter. I don't know how to explain it. It's amazing. So make home your happy place. Check out Parachute Home. They have like, it's not just towels. They've got rugs. They've got all this in-home softness. I don't know how to explain it, but you have to check it out. So Parachute Home Dot com So parachute, like the thing you use to jump out of airplanes, parachutehome.com slash yang. You get free shipping, free returns. You can try it out. Parachute's very comfortable, premium quality home essentials. You're going to love it. Check it out. David, you worked for a startup clean, clean tech firm or in the private sector and like turns a building and then went more into like the investing side, like bigger picture, frankly, what are you seeing from the private sector side of things? Yeah. So I think, and I think COVID helped to frame a lot of this discussion because I think pre COVID, you know, it was a lot of corporations were uh, when COVID hit corporations said, Hey, what is it that we weren't paying attention to that could drastically impact our future? Right. And, and I think there's a classic video that, Bill Gates is talking about a couple of years ago at TED where he's like, hey, something like COVID could be a multi-trillion dollar problem. And everyone just said, hey, that's Bill Gates talking, right? But then COVID hits and it's like, oh my God, he was right times a couple, right? And it's, and I think now you think, you see with like, 
for example, CEO of, of BlackRock, right? Larry Fink, $7 trillion asset manager, says last year, number one, our strategy is climate, right? Because I think, and when you're that big, every CEO is paying attention. And it's, and it's mattering, right? Because like you're seeing, you look at like the impact of ESG funds in this past year, right? There's now over 500 ESG funds you can invest in as for us, index funds, right? Where they're focused on climate solutions. And ESG for those, it's environmental, social governance. Some would call it green investing, depending on how you slice it. But you look at, looking at, let's call it climate impact or the governance upside and the societal impact as an investment risk. Correct. And and I would say, you know, so I, I've kind of lived it on the ground at a startup trying to build, and now I'm seeing it a little bit more from the investment side. And I think where I get excited is these problem, this problem is a massive problem and we should be very scared. At the same time, this is also the, I think the biggest value creation opportunity in our lifetimes, right? And I think that certain countries get that. I think China understands that, right? They are building uh, electric cars and vehicles, electric vehicles and batteries at a, at a rate that's out, outpacing the United States right now. And you see, I think a lot of these people like Larry Fink are saying this, not because they they inherently just care about the environment, even though they may, but because they see enormous opportunity to pivot the entire economy into new areas of growth, right? And we have, in a world where we have almost no growth, right, where you got to look for what those big pockets are growth. And when there's this much structural change, as, as Dr. Friedman said, of it doesn't matter the sector, they use energy, right? If you think about that structural change, that means that change is going to mean Entrepreneurs creating new businesses. I mean, think about Tesla, right? Multi-trillion dollar business. Over a trillion dollar business created to address one issue related to climate change. But think about the size of energy and everything that it touches. For me, I get really excited about, yes, we can work on the problem, but the way that you get people really motivated and in, and in, and, and this becomes sticky is by allowing them to be entrepreneurs in the space. So that there's so much to unpack there and I, and I agree with you. So having worked for a large company for about 10 years. The, the, the takeaway was they're going to do what it impacts their bottom line. There might be some altruistic CEOs that are committed to their good humans trying their best, but they get fired if they don't hit their quarterly profits and things like that. So the best thing on the corporate side of things feels like green is good, right? Where the green is greedy or however you want to say that, where there's financial incentive to lower energy costs or lower carbon emissions. Um, I want to unpack that in a second, but also I think Dr. Freeman is a good place to start just on the counter to start. You've worked in government before. It, what have you seen from a government response that will actually accelerate this? Are there ways they can incentivize the companies David's talking about to actually start accelerating this? Oh, there's an enormous amount that governments can do. And thankfully, Governments are starting to get serious about this. That's probably the better question. What are they doing now to start? <laughs> well, but, but that's the thing. Like, they're starting to get serious. They're not quite serious yet, but they're starting to get serious, right? Let's start with the fact that all the government money in the world isn't enough for this problem. We need a lot of private money in the mix as well. So as in the Democratic primary last year, we had some people saying $2 trillion a year and some people saying $10 trillion a year, like... It's actually still not enough money. Like we need we need money from the private sector to make this win. So what the biggest possible role for the government is to craft market aligning strategies, market aligning policies. So as an example of a couple of market aligning strategies that were successful in the United States, we had renewable portfolio standards. We had the solar investment tax credit. We had the wind production tax credit. Very recently, we've had 45Q for carbon capture and storage. In Germany, we had the Energy Vende, which was a bunch of feed-in tariffs for renewables. Combined with the European trading system, in China, there was a bunch of mandates where they just said, we're going to build 100,000 megawatts of wind. We're going to build 100,000 megawatts of solar. They just, like every system is different, but, but they actually put their shoulder into it and say, we're going to craft policies that the market values. So once a company realizes it can make money in the system, then they start doing it, right? That is that is actually the core of the business because there's only three sources of money in the world. There's rate payers, there's taxpayers, and there's shareholders. And there's not enough taxpayer money and there's not enough shareholder money. So you need the rate payers, you need customers around the world to start putting the money into this. And that means they need to get a return. 
You listed off a ton of things there. What's working the best? I get, you know, I guess I'm saying like I feel like the lowest common denominator probably has to happen globally. So th- this is the thing. There is no one answer to that. Every government gets to choose its own thing and make it work. So, for example, one can argue that a really positive, potent strategy in Canada is they've just announced a hundred and seventy dollar carbon tax. That's going to do a lot, right? <laughs> That will that will stimulate a lot of investment in Canada, no doubt about it. Like, but the, the and that will include government matching grants and so forth. That will include big oil companies and big insurance companies and pension funds putting money to work. Like all that stuff's going to happen. That's just a regulatory pathway. There's no incentive of any kind, but it does the job. You have to be big, binding, and down. And as long as you do that, it's good enough. And that can be in the form of an incentive or it can be in the form of a disincentive. Either way, though, one country doing it isn't enough either. We need lots of countries doing it. The One of the things that I find frustrating is many people forget that Russia exists. And so if we stop selling oil in the U.S., they just pick up the market. That doesn't exactly solve the problem, right? <laughs> and China exists. They make half the steel in the world and half the cement in the world and have three quarters of the coal-fired power plants. So if we don't get China on board, we're not exactly going to fix this problem. So it, it's it's thorny and complicated in a lot of ways, but fundamentally, you have to step up in a big market-aligning policy. And whatever that big market-aligning policy is, people can disagree on, but you still need that flavor of things. It's one of the things Andrew used to say on the trail when we were running for president. He'd say, look, if, if, US went to, if the United States went to energy, you know, zero in terms of emissions, it wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't because we're not enough of the, I mean, it would be better than nothing, of course, um, and and generally helpful, but it wouldn't stop what we're trying to fight against. It's a global issue. All right, Yank Speaks is brought to you by Athletic Greens. This is the most comprehensive daily nutritional beverage I've ever tried. I'm not the best at eating well. And in COVID, if you're ordering, like your, your habits are all, like you don't really have the right routine. And Athletic Greens can help just making sure you get all the veggies and all the vitamins and all the things you're supposed to have in a balanced diet. So one scoop of Athletic Greens got 17 vitamins, minerals, whole food source ingredients, it's got a multivitamin, a multimineral, probiotic, green superfood blends, like one of those green smoothies in a little pouch. It's awesome. And they work together to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet. Increases your energy, get a little more focus, all these good things. So you guys need to check this out. Go to athleticgreens.com slash yang and join health experts, athletes, and health conscious go-getters around the world to make a daily commitment to their health every day. And Athletic Greens is doubling down on supporting your immune system during the winter months. They're offering our audience a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase if you visit our link today. So you never have to buy vitamin D again. It's amazing. So that's athleticgreens.com slash yang. Get your free supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. Dr. La, I'm so fat. So I read your paper and I just want to say for those listening, Guys, I never read academic papers and I, I read this and I was, um, it's what it's worth. I'll put the link in, in this episode. Um, but what blew my mind is when we talk about climate change, we always talk about a lot of the stuff we just talked about with Dr. Friedman, like these big kind of, this is where we're going. We're melting the planet. The temperatures are rising. The sea levels are rising, this and everything. But what you and your colleagues talk about is like, hey, this is going to get really bad in the short term too, because you, you highlight the human cost where people start getting more asthma, people start having to move to certain places, there's um, healthcare systems start to get stressed, like there's yep. the lack of communication from governments, all these different things. So tell us about, a little about the human impact here. And I'm curious, so like, I, I guess like the big takeaways that you see from, from your paper and your research that starts to impact humanity quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is that I, this isn't something that is going to happen in the future. It is already happening now. Like we are already getting sick now. So we're already seeing that, you know, 300,000 people around the world in 2018, like, um, you know, 
died because of heat related stress that like wasn't there before. Like, I mean, these are, these are hundreds of thousands of people over the age of 65 in this case that it's like very conservatively, we can say they died because of these increasing heat waves that we're having. And also like people aren't able to work. And we saw this in like the, you know, the Valley and in, in California and the South and stuff over the last summer where it was huge heat waves and people just were like, I literally, my body cannot function in this situation. Like this is affecting me today. And sure the challenges are in other countries, but as well, but we're seeing them in the United States. The other thing that has struck me in all the research is that the benefits we have from moving to these cleaner sources of energy and moving the whole system, we feel them today. So as you say, it's like less kids with asthma, like kids, the number of kids that are getting asthma is completely mind blowing. And you can trace so much of it back to air pollution. It's coming from the same energy resources that are putting greenhouse gases in the air. So you're like, let's actually take that away. And then people who've never smoked getting lung cancer. And you're like, why on earth is this happening? Air pollution from the same sources. So I think the biggest things that I see is like in the research, you know, we've had to double check our numbers, like, you know, dozens of times to make sure we're, we're right on point around the fact that even if you ignore all this climate change business, Moving to cleaner sources of energy pays for itself through the health benefits that we feel now. Not that I will feel in the future the things I'm not going to experience. And in the U.S., the actions we take will help the world, but they will pay for themselves at home. I don't even have to look across borders to get the payback. But we're just not choosing to actually go down that path, at least not as quickly as we can. And I'll say like the incoming administration in D.C. is certainly signaling that they want to change that. There's a lot of cities and states that are signaling they want to change that, but we need more action faster, better. It's like, okay, great. On to the next thing. We need to be more aggressive and more aggressive if we're going to realize these health benefits. That's the thing. It, it, it gets my heart when I read about, you know, that grandmother who didn't live that extra 15 years of her life or that kid who got asthma who never should have had it. Like they, there was a way to prevent it. We talk about this so much when we talk about like eliminating poverty and that we do these, mm -hmm. we do these initiatives and programs that are supposed to either save money or like it's, there's certain things you save money for the government or save money for businesses, but we pay for it on the back end 10 times over. Right. So yeah. um, it's fun. I just loved reading your piece um, in your research because that's your, I hadn't thought about that from a climate change perspective, but it makes so much sense in that lens. What else can we do in terms of solutions? People need to recognize that we can and should combine a construction agenda with a reduction agenda. If we don't do both of those things, we're going nowhere, okay? So we cannot build our way to zero. We cannot just add stuff to the energy system and expect that's gonna work. But also if we just shut stuff down, that is not equitable, that does not create wealth. Like we can't get there doing either of those things alone. We have to combine a construction agenda with a reduction agenda. I, it's helpful and it focuses the mind to start talking about things that are outside of everybody's day-to-day -day experience thinking about this. And my favorite example is steel, okay? Steel is 9% of global emissions. If you don't fix steel, you don't fix anything, okay? So you gotta get there. Most people don't go to the store and buy 100,000 tons of steel. So don't think about the energy that's in steel, but like it emits more than cars. For every ton of steel, you emit three tons of carbon dioxide. And the math is any process that starts with melting rocks uses a lot of energy. So if you got to melt a rock, you're using a lot of energy. The recipe for sand is you melt, the, sorry, the recipe for glass is you melt sand and pour it on liquid tin. It just uses a lot of energy, okay? So steel is the same thing. But the other thing is you actually are chemically changing an iron ore to iron, an iron oxide to iron to do that you add what's called a reducing agent, that releases CO2 in most systems. So the blast furnace puts out a ton and a half of CO2 that's just the chemistry of making iron. It's completely independent of the fact that you're melting the rocks. So you just put out a ton of, of emissions every time you do this. And there's not a lot of substitutes for that. So the question is, how do you combine a con this thing I talked about, a construction agenda with a reduction agenda? And some of the work that we're doing suggests that the best thing to do is actually replace the whole plant. That the way the plants were built will continue to emit. You can capture, say, 50% of it. You can maybe get 7% more by electrifying stuff. You can maybe get another 20% by adding biomass, but you can't actually get to zero and we need to get to zero. You have to replace the existing facility with a different kind of facility, say direct reduction of iron, which can get to zero. 
and we have those technologies and they're in the field today, governments need to think about that. What policies do they put in place to tell the guy who runs a steel mill in Gary, Indiana, we want to replace your plant as opposed to we want to shut it down? That's a pretty different thinking. And so somebody's building something, we're making stuff in this country, but we're zeroing out the emissions at the same time. You know, I, I can't, but like you said, I can't buy a thousand tons of steel at my grocery store, right? But I can go buy products that have sustainable, uh, either goods going into them or sustainable packaging or compost, compostable packaging or plant-based packaging. And if we think about, and I think consumers are doing this. I mean, they are doing it like 2013 to 2018, 50, half of all growth in new CPG products was from sustainable products, right? So like one of every two products was sustainable. And now you guess what you see, Unilever, Pepsi, all these big guys are saying, hey, we're going to get to net zero by 2040, right? Because they recognize that consumers are voting with their dollars. And I think it goes back to what Julio was saying, which is, you know, rate payers ultimately are going to help to dictate a lot of this action. And by doing that, uh, the governments are going to listen, corporations are going to listen, and we're going to move things there. Now, I think government has to move things faster in order to uh, overcome some of the challenges that we saw when we were building net power. I think, you know, with, with net power, um, you know, our idea was how do, the rest of the world is going to build coal and natural gas. How do we get that to zero still? Right. And you look at India and China, they're putting in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. I mean, the amount of coal and natural gas going on the ground is is terrifying. Um, and so we can hope that everybody moves to renewables and batteries. But as Julio has described, that doesn't get us all the way in and of itself. We need a carbon capture solution for everything else, not to mention power generation. And frankly, you know, the, we had international governments that were more supportive of domestic governments at time. And it took time for international for domestic to catch up to where Europe was. And for the entrepreneur that's trying to build this, I mean, it, Tesla doesn't get to where it is today without the support by the Obama administration. And now they're feeding a ton of money back into the system that naturally pays for that itself. And I think government helps to support that acceleration of the build. I don't think anybody on this call, and you know, listen who can correct me, we're not suggesting that we want to all go live in bunkers. Like that's not the goal to solve climate change, right? The goal to solve climate change is enhance our standard of living while getting to zero. And by doing that, we need all minds, right? Minds, engineers, we need business people, we need scientists to solve some of these problems with novel solutions that allows us to factor sustainability into the solution without being unrealistic about what's going to happen. There's an important point in here. Like we actually know how to do a lot of stuff to make our lives better very quickly. Like we know how to replace a lot of the power, you know, plants in this country and around the world with cleaner technologies. Like we know how to do a lot of stuff. There is still a percentage of the whole system that we don't know what to do with. So like innovation is important, but I think people maybe overstate how much more innovation, how much more cost reductions we need. Like in many cases, I'm a PhD engineer, all right, but I work in a policy shop. Because the technical challenges are so often not what is actually keeping things from happening. That's not the problem. It's not the technology. It's not the cost. It's like not having a policy in place that actually rewards something for something very good it's doing. Not allowing something to get into the system. Like it's not allowing a customer to actually get what they want. I mean, I the number of stories I can tell you about someone who said, you know what, I've saved up and I want to put some of these new cheaper solar panels on my place. And I've got everything done and the utility won't let me tie in because they don't have rules of the road around this. And they, I don't know what to do. And they're telling me I've got to like go off grid or not have solar, you know, so I, I'm going to give up because I got 50 other things to do with my day. Like these types of things are the things we need to solve as well. While we're looking at that last get to zero, you know, last 10% or more, you know, we can talk about that too. But I think it's a really important point there. There's a lot we can do right away. We have to segregate innovation and deployment, right? Like we have to walk and chew gum. We have to do both, right? And like, it's not going to be that, some magic technology is going to enable us to all of a sudden get to net zero overnight. That's not going to happen. Although like, that's what the, the idiots like me are hoping for. We're actually all hoping for <laughs> smart people like you to yeah, figure this Everybody out. wants the secret diet pill, but... Yeah. Right. But <laughs> reality gets in the happen. way, yeah. right? And so I would say, like, we need to focus on large-scale deployment at, at across globally, right? And how to enhance that in our businesses, in our company, in our, in our communities, in our countries... That's critical, right? Innovation economy, I think, will feed a lot of those large-scale deployments. If we get the policy right up here, innovation entrepreneurs, will, I think, will meet that challenge and have already met that challenge because a lot of people have seen this coming for, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years or, or more. 
And so I totally agree with Melissa. You know, the silver bullet here is never going to be the answer. There's a lot we can do with technology we have today and should be doing and are doing some, but not enough. And I think that's our opportunity is to work through all of those, all those challenges, because when you do, I think there's a huge value creation on the other side of that. Are you losing your mind? Because I am in COVID. I am a little more stressed. I'm a little more short tempered. I sometimes just want to bang my head against the wall. I feel lethargic. And right now it's really helpful to talk to somebody. And that's why I want to talk to you guys about better help. Better help is a way to connect with someone to talk to in a safe and private online environment. It's super convenient. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not even self help really. It's just professional counseling done securely online. So you can send a message to your counselor anytime. You get these timely, thoughtful responses and schedule weekly phone or video sessions. And so you can specialize and talk to specialists in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, grief, all of it. I've been doing it's great, keeps me sane, I love it. So I want you to start living a happier life today and as a listener, you're gonna get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor, BetterHelp dot com slash yang that's better help h-e-l-p dot com slash yang join over one million people have taken charge of their mental health like us betterhelp.com slash yang there's a temptation to start drawing axes of contention where there aren't any most people agree that we need to deploy what we have today and innovate like, there's not actually a lot of debate around that. So it's not an either-or conversation, really. Some people think we should do more innovation. Some people think we should do more deployment. But, you know, you can still plow a field with a Russian tractor. It does the job. There's stuff you can do today. And you would ultimately like to be able to plow a field with something a little smarter somewhere down the line. So, like, we, and we know that innovation reduces risks, reduces costs, makes it easier for policymakers to get to yes. But the most important thing that people can do on their own is learn first, care second. In that order, they need to learn first and care second. Most people think electricity comes from the wall. They don't know that it comes from power plants around the country. They don't know what a power plant is or how it works. They don't know how power markets work, right? So they just scream, fix it without learning. That's not helpful because in fact, these things are complicated and require some knowledge and expertise. Similarly, once they start caring, good things happen. They elect people who care, for example, which is important to get the policies through that. Similarly, if enough people in the market said, hey, GM, we want a low carbon car, then GM can start procuring low carbon steel. Because to zero out the emissions from steel cost a whole lot to the steel maker, but to the person buying a car, it adds 2% to the car. It doesn't really make a difference to the ticket price, but GM is not going to disadvantage themselves in their market. They're not going to pay more for steel until the customers ask for it. And, and putting a carbon content label on the car doesn't do the job either. Like they need, you, you, you need to get people to learn enough that they can care and ask for things that matter in policy, in markets. And, and that is true in materials. That is true in energy. So this is, this is a fascinating question. Um, or point you're making. So I have this theory that all of our problems actually stem from education. When you don't educate a, your populace the right way, eventual bad things happen, particularly in a democracy. Uh, this is a weird question, but I, I'm so curious your thoughts. Is one of the best policies we could actually do is start teaching this more clearly in grade school and high school on a public level? Like with the, if you're talking about a 10, 20, 30 year timeline, or is no, it way too late really. for that? There's a, it's too late for that. And, and B, already people are starting to care and that's good enough. Like, like we're, we're right. getting, there's more caring and more learning that needs to be happening. But uh, I don't need to be a doctor to start learning about my health and caring about my health. Right. right. We don't need to make a world of experts. We need to make a world of people who know enough to care about the right things. And uh, in that context, you know, this is actually Melissa's strong suit. Like she, she, she understands this stuff deeper than I do. And that's probably the question for you, Dr. Lott, is uh, if we're going to start learning 
how do we do that? Um, particularly in the attention economy today, where you're not just competing against other ideas, which is competitive enough, let's say, but you're competing against Kim Kardashian and Instagram and whatever's on Facebook today. Like, how do you get people to learn, actually learn about this? Yeah. I mean, one of the big things that we look at in the work that we do for The Lancet, which is a medical journal, is how do people get information? How do they first get exposed to this link between climate change and health and the fact that like climate change is impacting your health now? And then the same sources of greenhouse gases or the same sources of pollution that's giving your kid asthma. Like, how do you make all these connections? And so, you know, there's a whole group of folks led, led by a woman named Hillary Graham who like say, OK, the reality is people Google for things that are about their health and then they link into information about climate change. Like that's the direction. It is very few, you know, a very small percentage of the time does it go the other way where they're looking at climate change stuff and they get into the health stuff. It happens, but the bubbles are big on the health side of things. So for us, I mean, that's one of our big opportunities where we say like, look, a lot of us, most of us go to the doctor at some point. Doctors are treating the effects of climate change. So let's help doctors to understand. So let's educate, let not this blanket, you know, of course we want everyone to understand, but like a doctor is trying to treat the symptoms instead of the root cause. Let's show them what the tools are for the root cause. And I'll tell you, like we have a huge group of doctors that is now taking the analysis we do and using it to say, we want different policies. We want to reduce our own emissions footprints. Healthcare systems are 5% of global greenhouse gas emissions, 5%. So they're like, this is something I can control now. <laughs> and so we're going to demand it. So you've got things like in the UK where their national healthcare system is going to net zero. Like you've got commitments like this. You've got a whole program in a VL um, led by a woman named Jody Sherman, who's like looking at this and saying, what can we do today in American hospitals to have the outcomes improve? So we're healthier over time. Treatments are still getting better. But we're not actually on the back end of that getting better in the short term, making people sick, both in the short and the longer term. Like, how can we do that? So I think education, I think this actually comes back to a point that sums up a lot of what we're talking about right now. One of the things that I think slows us down and I see slowing us down is conversations where we say or a lot. So I like solar or wind. I like solar or natural gas with CCS. I like electric vehicles or I like zero carbon cement, you know, whatever the examples are. I like one thing. We, we step back and we switch that to an and conversation and we say, okay, what is the goal? The goal is reducing emissions. The goal is to be healthy and to be healthier over time and to not undermine our health by letting climate change and air pollution and all the other stuff that comes with it get us to be sicker over time. So this and this and this, I'm for all these things that get us to that goal. The goal is not the technology. That's not the point. The goal is to reduce emissions and make us healthier. Theoretically, I'd like to not worry about this, you know, or like it's based baked into the fabric of society where we're always totally. keeping the planet in front of mind, right? Uh, David, have mm -hmm. you seen this? Actually, this is really curious when the for-profit side of things, David, that you have companies, they're starting to care now because it affects their bottom line, right? Or can, or they see the, the dollar signs, which I'd argue is a good thing, but are they learning, right? Or is there like, is there a learning on the investment side? I mean, it's a weird question, but I am curious what your thoughts are. No, on. it's a good, I think it's a good question. I, I think, yes, they're being forced to learn. I think you have pension funds, which are asking the big asset managers to care, and so then they have to hire consultants to help them care, to help them learn. And I think, you know, I had a really smart uh, asset manager tell me, he said, you know, environmental feels like playing defense, playing offense and being efficient. So defense is around how do I how do I reduce my risk? Right. How do I make sure that I don't have runoff issues or long term super site issues that are ba could bankrupt my company? Right. That's that's like a uh, huge risk, huge tail risk for these businesses. Efficiency is. That makes money today, right? Like companies, you go put in LEDs, you make money today. Your your payback is two, three years at bet. Like in the worst case, if, if you have old lighting, you replace new HVAC, you do, you know, you upgrade some, some of your vehicles from gas guzzlers to hybrids. Like you make money, you make money today, right? You reduce your waste, you make money today, right? And that's, so that's being more efficient with resources you have. And then offense is how do I ensure that I'm positioning the companies for growth in this new economy, right? So how do I build sustainability into my product line? How do I position myself with customers and with investors? How do I ensure that my employees are engaged on sustainability issues? Because our generation cares a ton about this issue and in order to retain, right. re, you know, retain people, people yeah. it's a huge, huge issue, right? And so I really like that framing, you know, I can't take credit for it, but I really like that framing to say, am I going to lose a ton of money as a result of not doing something? How do I, how do I operate within the bounds of what I already do today? And then how do I position myself for growth? I think those are great questions, regardless of the size of the business, you can ask yourself. This takes me back to where I started with. The future of energy is net zero. 
And so a whole bunch of companies figure that out enough to make declarations. They're like, we're going to go to net zero. And then they turn around to their staff and say, tell me how to get there. And actually wrote a blog piece on this. It's posted on the Carbon Direct website. And they turn around and their whole staff goes, we don't know. We, we can't get to zero. And uh, I've had the good fortune of working with Microsoft on, on their announced goals. They're going to get to net zero by 2030. It's incredibly ambitious. And they, have, they emit 16 million tons a year. That's pretty small for a company of Microsoft's side, but they're a software company. Okay, 16 million tons. They know how to get all the way down to six. So if they do everything they know how to do, they can get rid of two thirds of their emissions and a third are left. And then they're like, oh crap, well, how do we get to zero? Let's say they innovate like mad and they invest in a whole bunch of mad scientist stuff that doesn't exist and get another 2 million tons down. They're still at 4 million tons. They've only gotten rid of three quarters of their emissions. They still got a quarter left. And they got nothing for that. Zero. The future is zero and zero's hard. And in that context, we have to try things that we haven't tried. Yes, we need to plant trees, but we also need to do things like direct air capture. And we can't leave anyone off the field. To Melissa's point, we can't just say, well, I like solar, that's enough. It's like, no, it's clearly not. <laughs> it's like, and the most sophisticated companies have already acknowledged that. And now they're scrambling to try to put together a plan for their net zero commitments because they know they have to get there. Like, like David said, that is offense and defense and efficiency all at the same time. Like they're all doing those things and they still can't get to zero. So we need to be generous with each other as we build this world. We need to be creative. We need to be open-minded. We need to have innovation in business every bit as much as we need innovation in technology and every much as we need innovation in law and policy. We, it's a all hands on deck to get to net zero. And the companies are beginning to understand that and they are learning to the point that now they can think about what to care about. One thing that is great about the zero point is it gives us clarity in the discussion though. Like we're not splitting hairs or if it's 75% or 80% or you know 60 by insert a year, insert your favorite year here. The goal is zero. Everything is driving to zero. That is where we're headed. And it gives us a clarity in the conversation. And I'll say to David's point, like I remember we created a, a great video game about a decade ago, 12 years ago, that was called uh, Yville with Y Power. You could operate your own power plants and grid. Super cool. What you learn from that is that kids at that time who are now in their 20s are environmentalists, at least in the US, but also in the global people that played that game. They're environmentalists. That's it. They saw the oceans acidifying. They saw the air getting polluted. They didn't care about the bottom line. They were like, no, how do I do this? And how do I do it cost effectively? But I feel like this is, some, this is a pressure that is under acknowledged is the consumer desire and the growing consumer desire for these things. I wanna highlight another kind of undercurrent that I don't hear it talked about enough. And I think it's appropriate because I've heard, you know, when I hear Andrew Yang talk about this, he talks about the equitability of automation, right? Is the story of the 90s and 2000s. I think uh, Julio brought up the point of equitability of, of this energy transition, right? And you have a lot of communities out there that it takes a lot, it creates a lot of jobs for maintaining legacy systems, right? And and often these communities are out, you know, typically rural, right? Power plants tend to be out in the, in the middle of the country. And those are really nice paying jobs. And I think you ha we have to build a community that see that sees the future of the energy transition as positive for them, not just because, listen, the, the, envir the environmental and the health benefits are absolutely important and should justify it in and of itself. But people still want to go to work and get paid and use their skills. And one of the things I think I learned incredibly well at NetPower is, listen, we had some fantastic scientists, PhDs out the wazoo, probably too many of them, right? What we what we learned early on was that they weren't the people to build and to maintain and to operate, right? We needed to build all that tent big enough for all those people to be under and leverage their expertise because our smartest people had no idea when it came to how to maintain pumps and valves and compressors and all of these other things that, in, that go into maintaining a coal plant or maintaining a steel plant or maintaining a fertilizer plant. And I think that all, that conversation is one that policy has to be a part of and companies have to be a part of, but we can't forget in this conversation. The news has gone sideways in many ways, and it's one of the reasons I like The New Yorker. In print and online, The New Yorker kind of stands apart 
There's a commitment to truth and accuracy, and it's got really quality writing, compelling reporting and storytelling. And I love it because it's not always politics. Um, so they've got weekly print, but they've got daily online articles that cover this full range of topics. So not just politics, but there's news, international affair, climate change, the environment, pop culture, arts, fiction, food, humor, cartoons, you name it. One article I was reading was on unethical AI, which I am fascinated by and I want to cover on here. This guy, Matthew Hudson, wrote a pretty fascinating piece on what AI could look like um, down the road. So I want you guys to check this out. So if you're a limited time, you can get 12 weeks of The New Yorker for literally six bucks. That's a savings of 50%. They're giving you a big discount because you're listening to Yang Speaks. Plus listeners of the show get an exclusive tote bag for free. Can't get anywhere else right here. So go to newyorker.com slash Yang. That's N-E-W-Y-O-R-K-E-R dot com slash Yang to get 12 weeks in The New Yorker for just $6. And you get a free tote bag, carry it around. So newyorker.com slash yay. Is there anything that's exciting you down the road that could work, that could start to solve this, that we could get excited about? Oh God, the last, the list is so long. I mean, I honestly think some of the most exciting stuff is stuff that I can see each of us adopting in our lives, as opposed to these kind of far out of reach. No offense, I don't have a lot of say over that steel production facility in my own daily life. So like utilities letting me check a box and say that I want hundred percent of my electricity to come from zero carbon resources. Like I check a box, I forget about it the next month and I have done something meaningful that is measurable. Like it sounds so boring, but that to me that's exciting. And you know what? Not, not even everywhere in this country, but certainly not around the world. That's not just a default option you can pick. What I'll say is in this whole transition, I know Julio, you've got lots of great thoughts about tech we have an opportunity to either exacerbate equity gaps, make them worse, or narrow them. And really intentional steps forward can narrow them. We know where a power plant is. The lucky thing about it is they don't have feet and they don't run around. You know, we know where it's going to be. We know the community that will be impacted. We know the makeup of that community. Like we can do things very intentionally. We won't do that if we don't think about it. Um, but Julio, you you have the rundown on the cool tech, so I'm going to pitch it over to you. There's two things that I'm super excited about, uh, and I'm going to start with with the most obvious and nearest term one, which is hydrogen. Uh, Hydrogen is going to be a big honking thing. And the nice thing about hydrogen is there's no pollution with it. None. When you consume hydrogen, it turns into water and that's it. It either makes heat or it makes electricity and either way, the byproduct's water. Okay. So if you make the hydrogen with a low carbon footprint, you can do a lot. And and it's the Swiss army knife of decarbonization. It goes into heavy industry. It goes into the transportation sector. You can make fuels out of it like methanol or ammonia. You can put it straight into the grid. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. And in the, in the context of that, I want to head back to something Melissa just mentioned. Um, if you replace an existing power plant of some kind with a hydrogen plant, you should have no pollution with it of any kind. So you should be able to do that in a way that's fair and equitable. And to do that requires union labor. So you should be able to do it in a way which is good paying jobs that are long-term jobs, right? So so there's a way in which hydrogen can be brought forward that's smart and equitable and real. And we'll see if we do that or not. Dr. Freeman, why isn't that happening now? Is because the technology is too new or just existing just the resistance so to change in general. There, there's a couple of reasons, but uh, first and foremost, there is there, there's no market aligned policy. It goes back to where I started, right? So we have a production tax credit for solar and wind. We have an investment tax credit for solar and wind. We got nothing for hydrogen. So who's going to make it? To make zero carbon hydrogen today costs between two times and ten times more than hydrogen that emits. Who's going to make it? <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we need to create market aligning incentives to do it. And that could be a clean energy standard, a clean electricity standard. That could be a production tax credit for low carbon hydrogen. There's all kinds of things you could do, but, but you got to start getting the market apparatus going. Okay. You also need to do things like replace truck engines with fuel cells. It'll take some time. It'll take some money to do that. And you need to have fueling stations where people can get hydrogen. So there's I could spend the whole rest of this program talking about that. I won't. There's good reasons why not. But but that's something I'm excited about because the technology's gotten cheap enough and the ambition's gotten high enough that we're starting to get alignment between the ambition and the price. And that's that's when exciting stuff starts to happen. 
And at this point, I just hope that the crazy people on both ends of the dumbbell don't shriek it away. Um, because in fact, there's a lot of heavy lifting to be done in the middle and it looks like we're getting to that point. The, the other thing I'm excited about is CO2 removal. So we have that residual emission stack that we can't get rid of, okay? And for the past 20 years, I've been he he hearing people say, don't even talk about that because if we talk about it, we'll, we'll stop reducing emissions. Well, guess what? Like we didn't reduce emissions. We're stuffed. We still need to do this. But and people didn't want to talk about carbon capture because it would give people an excuse to keep emitting carbon. Carbon, yes. excuse me. That's like saying the existence of Diet Coke means nobody will lose weight. It's a ridiculous yeah. argument, but you know, there you there go. But but uh, <laughs> be that as it may, uh, we uh, it's now we ha we realize that we are going to overshoot. If we want to have a just and verdant world, we're going to have to do a lot of CO two removal to get to zero. Again, to Melissa's point, net zero is clarifying. Zero means nothing. So if you emit anything anywhere, you have to remove that amount. And when you get into big scale CO2 removal, we need trees, we need soils, we need direct air capture devices, which I am excited about. We need biohydrogen with CCS. We need carbon mineralization. We need mangroves. We need all of the above on that too. There's just not enough tonnage with any one of those things. You can't get the 10 billion tons a year we're gonna need with just one thing. So it's all of the above all over again. And it gives us, I think, an opportunity to be generous with each other again, to say, we know we need to spend money. We know we need to try lots of stuff. We know one of us alone is not gonna do the job. So let's all work together and do this incredibly important thing. And we're, we've seen Mark Carney, at the Bank of England now, launched this transparency thing for carbon offsets. We've seen a bunch of banks start getting into this. We've seen tech companies like Google and Amazon and Microsoft and Apple start getting into the CO2 removal business. That's exciting. So this is a very non-scientist question uh, or maybe possibly naive question. So there's technology out there where let's call it a device or something sucks carbon out of the air. Like how does that work? Where can it go? Like I'm just more curious of the implementation of that technology. Right, so and that's probably a That technology question. was invented in the thirties for submarines. Like we've had it for a long time. What's exciting now is we're starting to scale it. So there's a handful of companies, companies like Climeworks and Carbon Engineering that will do that, which will build the plant and suck the CO2 out of the air and store it in the deep geosphere forever. Good. So we didn't have companies 10 years ago. Now we got companies. That's a step forward. And right now the technology is ballpark four to 600 bucks a ton, which is too much to pay. Great. We know how to reduce costs. That's one thing we do know how to do. You put money into innovation, you make market aligning policies, you deploy a bunch of stuff and the costs go down. Like we've done that with everything for LEDs, for batteries, for flat screen TVs. Like we know the recipe for that one. And now we're starting to see voluntary markets come together and companies like Microsoft put money into it and companies like Carbon Direct organizing their thinking and companies like McKinsey recommending to governments that they change the way they think. Like that's like you're starting to see bits of the ecosystem come together in a useful way. And you can put that anywhere in the world. You can put it in the North Slope of Alaska. You can put it in the Gulf of Mexico. You can put it in Abu Dhabi. You need zero carbon heat. You need zero carbon electricity. As long as you got those things, you can do direct air capture. In the New York context, believe it or not, the building codes can help. Because there's a new civic code that says all buildings have to be net zero by 2025. Mm -hmm. Which is very, very and, challenging. And if they situation. don't, they have to pay $477 a ton. That's enough money to start paying for stuff. And that is where, look, governments can't create value, but they can they can align incentives. They can incentivize value, right? And that's kind of where we need to go. David, what is exciting you? I want to talk about culture, right? I, I think what excites me is, I think what Julio mentioned of like, people start to are starting to see the art of the possible in clean energy. And that really excites me. And I think um, what Julio mentioned of like, you know, 10 years ago, solar was 10 times more expensive. You know, wind was three times more expensive, right? And when you... When you like see that on a scientist projection, where well, you're like, well, okay, maybe we'll see, right? When that's backward looking, that's a big deal, right? And I think people start to get excited about what the world can look like, not what it looks like today. I think you know we've been we've been spoiled by Moore's law in the technology world that 
you know, things just get smaller and cheaper over time when it comes to semiconductors. What people have shown is that like the same process of like you double the scale, you reduce cost, like that doesn't just apply to semiconductors, right? And I think what part of the, we just have to start. And I think there's so many people now getting in this game and getting excited about it that it, you know, big companies are listening, governments are listening, things are starting to change. Is it happening fast enough? No, but I think part of that is our opportunity, right? For those that are in the space to be in it and to hopefully do really well from it. I would say too, you know, I think uh, your point around short change being a four letter word, I think when it's imposed, no matter who it is, it's a four letter word, right? When you feel like you have a control of your own world and control of your own change and can benefit from that change, it's the most exciting thing in the world. And I would point to what California has done with low carbon fuel standard, you know, and like the growth in renewable energy credits that have happened as a result of for farmers that have pig farms and cow farms. Like you go up and down Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, there's not a cow farm and a pig farm that hasn't been knocked on their door like 20 times because it is a gold rush right now. And those guys are making a ton of money on basically taking the farts from their cows, their their cows and their pigs and doing something with it and then selling that gas into the California market that the that the big companies over there have to pay for. Like they are making a ton of money. You got a lot of farmers in the Midwest who made a ton of money from wind and solar. Like that change is exciting, right? That's why you get I think really positive change in those communities. When it's imposed, it's negative, right? And this I think clean energy is a way for entrepreneurs to benefit. One thing you recommend the average human to start doing that if everybody was doing, we'd be in a better place. I, I think what Julio said resonated with me, like learn first, care second. Um, learn what in your community, in your business, in your you know day-to-day life, you can, how you can impact. And some of it, you know, for some people is just going to be electing the right people, calling your senator, your, you know, we live in a representative democracy. We have the ability to change what happens in policy. But for a lot of people, like their business can make change, right? And and I think what we talked about with efficiency, like putting LEDs is a cost benefit thing. Like it, there's a huge amount of benefits, not just mention energy efficiency. Like it, it generates more light, makes life, it makes world, the, it's safer, right? It make, makes it look better for your customers. So like simple stuff, right? Done in aggregate, I think can change the world. And I think that as people start to learn and then care, um, I really like that as a framework. Dr. Lott, what would you say? I mean, I think it stems off of what David just said, which is realizing like this is your health we're talking about. And this is your health right now we're talking about. This is important. This matters right now. This isn't some mystical thing in the future. And so, you know, we've got so many layers of government that we can say, hey, you represent me. This is important to me and we need to act on this. And with our collective voices, we can do a lot. Like that's how policy gets done is when we say, okay, across aisles, across conversations, like we want this. This is important to us. Let's do it. So people get so consumed with D.C. and D.C. is important, but so is your local city hall. Right. Probably more important. I agree with you. Um, and Dr. Freeman, close with you. The short, snippy answer, if there's one thing people can do, they can vote. Please go goddamn vote. Vote, goddamn it. <laughs> we, need, we need voters who yeah, vote about this stuff. Not voting. We got issues, but I'm with you. Like we're still at 40 percent voting. Like perhaps we can do a little better than that. Mm-hmm. You know, but but really the, the most important thing for people to do right now, more than anything else, even, like I'm, I still like learn and care like that's a good thing to do. Learn that 77 percent of Americans don't have rooftops, so they can't do rooftop solar. Like that's a good thing to learn before you care about how to fix that. Um, but but the thing that I want people to do more than anything else, like be generous. And the person I'm channeling these days more than anybody else is Yoda. Uh, I'm really trying to channel Yoda in everything I do these days. And my favorite Yoda quote is, fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. That's no way to fix this problem, folks. We can't fix it by being more angry and more shrill. We got to be generous and work together to fix the problems. And if we listen and if we're generous, we can get there. Wow, that is... There's nothing more fitting than closing this conversation with a quote from Yoda. So thank you. I think my takeaway here is that the future of energy is that there is no future unless we figure out the present of energy in its own way. Like we don't start doing things now. Um, The future can be very exciting, but we need to do something um, collectively now. So look, 
You all are so impressive. Um, I was on pins and needles this entire conversation, just trying to keep up with the, the brain power on this Zoom call um, and on this podcast. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for joining Yang Speaks, the future of energy. Talk soon, y'all. It was our pleasure. Thank you. 